Hi everyone, welcome to this sort of interlude video. Um, it seems to be a little bit out of sequence, but we are going to need this um, a lot for what's coming next, which is the dynamic mode decomposition. And in its own, it's also, I think, an interesting topic because well, it, it, it concerns linear systems once more and how we can determine their stability. In the continuous time case, we have seen this already, but here the question is how does this relate to the discrete time case? Right? And so I'm trying to establish a connection between continuous time and discrete time. And we are also going to see what stability properties we have and what frequency or conditions on stability and what determines the frequency of a system. And again, in continuous time and in discrete time. And so let's start with what we know already. We have seen before that our Oh, beloved continuous time system is x dot equals a times x, right? And then given some initial condition. So if we have this initial condition, what we also know is that the solution of this is simply given by the exponential function or the matrix exponential of a times t and then multiplied from the right with our initial condition. Okay, so simply enough. And we have seen, this is sort of a repetition now, but I'm going to use this to relate it to the discrete time case in a minute. Um, we have seen that the eigenvalues of our matrix A play a really vital role in determining the, the dynamical behavior, okay? So the eigenvalues are, uh, let's note them lambda one to lambda n for an n-dimensional system. And I'm again in the situation where I assume that all of them are unique. Well, things get a little bit more complicated. You can extend this to double eigenvalues or multiple eigenvalues in general. But let's stick with this situation for now. And what we have seen before is that we can, if this is a, every eigenvalue is unique, we can simply uh, use the eigenvectors to do a change of, of coordinates of this matrix. And what we got was that this A matrix becomes the P matrix, which was the matrix where in every column we had one eigenvector, times our capital lambda, right? This is on the diagonal, we have all the eigenvalues lambda 1 to lambda n, times P inverse, okay? So this gave us a, a, a coordinate transform, if you wish, and now if we insert this, or, you know, put the P and P inverse to the other side, we can replace the A by, by this one, and what we got was that this matrix exponential e to the a times t can simply be expressed, and I'm going to do th this in more detail in the discrete time case in a minute, but here what we saw is that this was p times e to the lambda t times p inverse. And so this makes things a lot easier because uh, this is a diagonal matrix, so what we get is a diagonal matrix with e to the lambda 1t, e to the lambda 2t, until e to the lambda nt. So we have individual <coughs> frequencies or eigenvalues and they are decoupled. So we have found a coordinate transformation in which the individual coordinates are changed, right? And so what we found is if we do this for the original system here, then we can say that we get this, exactly what I said now, p, and then we have e to the lambda 1t, e to the lambda nt, times p minus 1 x 0. So all I've done is I've inserted this one here, and what you can see is that this is now sort of a new initial condition, or you can interpret this as this, right? So a change of coordinate, and then we have a dynamical system where we have these modes, right? Let's call them modes, these vectors, oscillating or, you know, behaving dynamically according to these eigenvalues. <clears throat> so everything is encoded in the eigenvectors, these principal components, if you wish, and the associated eigenvalues. So this is nothing new, but what we want to do now is we're going to see how this works out in the discrete setting. And before we do so, one thing that we saw, let's look at this particular eigenvalue lambda, and let's call it a plus jb. And so I'm omitting the index here. I could make this, you know, lambda one, lambda two, and so on, but this, let's just make it for, to avoid all these indices, make it um, shorter. And what we've seen is if I now take the exponential of e to the lambda t, then what I get is e to the, I insert this, what I get is a t times, I'm using a, a rule for the exponential here, plus j, 
et. <coughs> so, you know, product means the addition of the exponents. So this is exactly this. Um, and what we also know is from Euler's law that this becomes e to the at times, and this is cosine bt plus j times sine bt. Okay, so simple uh, rule for, for exponential uh, complex numbers. And so we saw, and now this is what I can do uh, in, in my table here, we saw that in continuous time, stability is determined by the real part of the eigenvalue, okay? So in continuous time, we have lambda as our eigenvalue, or we have n of them, but let's say for, for lambda. And the stability was that the real part of lambda has to be negative, right? Um, of all lambdas, right? As soon as we have one, zero, this means stability, marginal stability, or if it's positive, if one is positive, we have an instable system. All right, and then the frequency we see, the imaginary part apparently plays an important role in the frequency with which the system oscillates, right? So the frequency is simply related to the imaginary part of lambda, right? And if it's a real number, we have no oscillations. If it's an imaginary number, so a truly non-zero complex component um, or imaginary part, then we get oscillations. Okay, so this should be known by now, but now let's relate this to discrete time systems. So what we have now is we have x a plus one is a tilde, and I'm going to relate a tilde to a in a second, times x at time iteration k, and or, yeah, in the same way, this is equation one to one, this is the, the second one now, x of k in general can be computed by simply raising a to the kth power, and then times x at point zero, okay? So you see very close relation. And now here's the thing, what does this a tilde have to do with the a? And then we're going to go step by step, relate a tilde to a, and then relate the corresponding eigenvalues to the eigenvalues of this one, and then study what are the properties for discrete systems to be stable and to determine their frequency. All right, so let's have a look at this a, and let's say that this was a discretized version, let's say, you know, like, uh, the, the, the underlying system is continuous in time, and we just have written it down as a discrete system. Then we can try to map this A, or derive this A from this A uh, without the tilde. And so this is simply done by saying that E tilde is E to the A times our time step delta T. So what I'm doing is now I'm going from time step k to k plus one means I have, a, I have a time dist of delta t. And so you can simply use this. I'm going from time zero to time delta t if I insert delta t here. So very easy to do this. Um, and what I can do now is I can try to again find uh, an expression of this form. So this is going to take a few steps now, but what you can do is we can say, um, you know, we insert a definition for the matrix exponential, which is the series expansion of increasing um, uh, powers of the exponent and divided by, by the corresponding uh, factorial number. So this is um, this one plus, um, and now I'm going to name this P tilde already, P tilde, lambda tilde, E tilde minus one. So again, I can, if I have eigenvectors, so let's call this tilde as well, I can relate the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of, oh, excuse me, I made a mistake. Um, there I was ahead of myself. I, obviously, I need the expression for, for the A, right? So what I'm going to need is the pay, P, this P, and this lambda. Um, lambda E minus one divided by one plus uh, times delta t, obviously, plus the second term, which would be this raised to the second power and then divided by two. Um, so we get p lambda e minus one, e lambda p minus one, and then delta t squared. So I'm allowed to put this delta squared to the back because it's just a scalar. So I, I can shift it wherever I want. And now this has to be divided by two. 
And you see, this is not complete, obviously, we have to go to infinity, right? So what this still entails is terms of order three, four, five, and so on. But this is our series expansion. And what I can do now is with a simple step, I can say, okay, obviously these two cancel each other out. I can say that the identity matrix is P times P inverse. And so you see that every time uh, in every expression I have P times P inverse, uh, left and right. So here the same way. So what I can do is I can simply say that what I get is P times, now in brackets, uh, the identity matrix plus lambda delta T plus lambda squared delta T squared F and so on. So you see where I'm going times P inverse. So you see all I've done is, you know, put the P to the left and the P inverse to the right um, because, you know, this is just a sum so I can do it term by term if it appears everywhere. And so what I get in the end is really um, the expression for the exponential function, right? So what I get is P. Um, and now what I can do is I can get, because this is a diagonal matrix, I can derive the exponential term everywhere. So I get exactly this. So what I have is e to the lambda 1t, e to the lambda nt, and everywhere 0. And so what have I done? I've see, we see that I've related this to this. And so we see that these are really the eigenvalues now of our new system. Okay, so here I had a is p lambda p inverse. And here is a tilde is p, a new matrix, p inverse. Okay, so you see we have made a clear connection between the continuous and the discrete time case simply due to this rule, okay? So all what we need is, or what we get is, I can, we can rename them if you wish and give them no names for the discrete time eigenvalues. So I'm going to name, name them mu, so this is mu1, the mu n. Okay, and so this is very interesting. You see the eigenvectors do not change and the eigenvalues are related by this exponential function. Oh, excuse me, this is delta t here. Right, the time step that I've used before. So depending on what, which way I choose delta t, I get these new eigenvalues. And so what you can see if I insert this now here, what I will get is I get x at time step k. So this is really just taking this one here. Um, then I need just to insert this. So I have p times mu1 to the power of k until mu n to the power of k. p inverse x at 0. And again, we have this strong relation to what we had here. This is our initial condition in a new coordinate system, okay? So we have made this clear connection and uh, we can now identify what stability means, okay? We have seen stability in the continuous time setting is a negative real part. So what we had is that this e to the lambda t, uh, sorry, a t, the prefactor that determines whether it grows or decays over time, this and let's look at the absolute value of this, is for a negative um, a, so a negative real part, this will be e to the minus something, so we divide one by a number greater than one, so this will be smaller than one. Right? In the same way, e is two to the 2.7 something, if we raise it to a positive power, this will be greater than one. Or, oh sorry, excuse me, for the case a negative or for the case A positive. And so here we have it, um, this real part discussion on stability now becomes for discrete time, if I take mu here, that my absolute value of this eigenvalue has to be smaller than one. So whereas here we need eigenvalues to be in the left half of the complex plane, 
In the discrete time case, we need them to be restricted to the unit circle. This means stability. And then for the frequency, there's no real trick to be had. We just need to check how we can transform the mu to a lambda again. Okay? So we adhere. The imaginary part of lambda is what's really important. And so the calculation you can now do is you can take the lambda, <coughs> sorry, you take the logarithm, and then divide by delta t, and then take the imaginary part, right? So what you do is you take the imaginary part, excuse me, of taking the log of e to the lambda delta t will give you lambda delta t. Okay, so log of mu gives me lambda delta t, and then we divide this by delta t. This will give me the lambda, and so the imaginary part is what determines the frequency. Okay, so as I said, this was sort of an interlude video, but this is really important if we want to study uh, continuous time or discrete time systems. This also pops up if we have, let's say, Euler discretizations of, of systems and so on. So in nomarics, this is quite important. And we have seen, okay, the absolute value clearly plays an important role in terms of stability instead of the real part. And so in the next videos, we are going to study the dynamic mode decomposition, and we will see that we want to learn from discrete time series data something about continuous time systems, and this is where this connection really becomes important. So stay tuned for this, and see you in the next video.